bless the name of the Lord. Let's welcome our online church this morning. Come on, put your hands together as we welcome our online church. Amen. Please let us know where you're worshiping with us from and just indicate in the comments. Amen. Uh, before you sit down, welcome five people, fist bump them, prophesy to them, to tell them this morning is your morning. Your life is changing. This morning is your morning. Your life is... Get out of your seat, five people. Let them know this morning is your morning. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. I'm in Hebrews chapter 1. I'm in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Uh, they are working, leave them alone. I just don't understand why the volume is high, but they are working, amen. It's all right, it's cool. Amen. Hebrews 11 verse 1, are you there? Let's do one to five quickly, then we can get to work. On the count of three, one, two, three, read. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness, God testifying of his gifts, and through it being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Six, but without faith, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I will go with the title for this morning, The Force of Faith. The Force of Faith. We are in a series called, which means living in faith every day. Amen. Tell your neighbor, living in faith every day. Let's try the other neighbor, living in faith every day. And the acronym is simply LIFE. Amen. Please be seated. It is very nice to talk about faith, but it is better to live by faith. Amen. Because sometimes when we talk about faith, out of the great revelations and the conversations of faith, they can be exciting. But that excitement must translate into results. Amen. Now, I'll start from the other side, and I'll start from the place of why most people who believe that they are in faith, why seemingly their faith does not work. Amen. Seemingly that you thought you were in faith, you were believing God for something, and it seemed like whatever you were believing did not work or has not worked. Why didn't it work? Why wasn't it working? And, and I'm, I don't want to say it was not working. I'm explaining why it may appear that way. And the reason why this is a wrong statement to make is because faith always works. So I cannot say why faith did not work because that is already a problem. If it didn't work, it wasn't faith. Are you okay? Tell your neighbor, faith always works. Try the other neighbor, tell them, faith always works. And having small faith is not the problem. The problem is the lack of growing your faith. Amen. Amen. So that if there's something that is big, the, let's put it gym again. So if you want at, on one particular event, maybe you've said by the end of this year, I must lift 500 kgs. It means you must start exercising your faith now. So that by the end of the year, you've got the capacity to handle the weight of what you want to lift. Same manner, if you're believing and trusting God in confidence that this year something will be tangible that will come to you, start applying now so that by the end of the year, your faith muscle has grown. 
to handle what it is that you are perceiving, believing, or mani want to manifest. Are you with me? And the problem with most of us is we want to manifest faith suddenly. Just suddenly. Now we're in the year of suddenlies, but the suddenly is produced by exercising. Are you there? I say to you through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of yourself more highly than he ought to think. But to think what? Now, to think soberly means you have a discerning of where you are. Amen. To think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Amen. Are you okay so far? Now, some of the measures just to help you understand. Jesus said it this way. Uh, in fact, I can do that without the verses. He says, if you have faith as small, that's a measure. Are you there? If you have faith as small as a... So meaning there is master seed measure faith. You're right. And master seed measure faith is big faith. Because it may be small as a mustard seed, but it moves mountains. You're right. And you'll find that in Matthew 17, uh, 20. And you find that in many places. If you've got faith as small as a mustard seed, you will say, thank you, you guys. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. And nothing will be impossible with you. Amen. Are you all right? Master seed size faith is a measure. All right? Uh, Matthew 6. I think it's... Let's go to Matthew 6. I should have started with Matthew 6 before going to that one. Matthew 6. Jesus is Lord, help me now. Matthew 6.30. Everybody read with me. One, two, three, read. Media, thank you. Will he not, go back, go back. Will he not much more owe you of, are you there? Little faith is a, are you all right? And little faith is demonstrated when you can't have confidence in God to provide you clothes and food. It's in your Bible. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and then tomorrow gone, how will he not also do what? O you of what? Now, little faith is demonstrated in, if you like, Maslow's law of, yeah, that, that basic entry level of Maslow's law of, of needs, hierarchy of needs. That is where little faith is. Are you there? Next level, according to scriptures, is mustard seed, which is little but can move mountains. And mustard seed, the Bible says, <laughs> nothing will be impossible if you have just faith as little as mustard seed. All right? My favorite is Matthew chapter 8. And, 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 and I tend to get carried away, so God will have to help me here. Because when I get into Matthew chapter 8, yeah. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Next verse. Uh -huh. And behold, let's go to Matthew 8, 8. Matthew 8, 8. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, so back up the six so we can get the story. Thank you. It starts from five. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a who? came to him pleading with him, next verse, saying, Lord, my servant 
is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and do what? Now, please notice, who's speaking? The centurion is asking for Jesus to pray for his servant who is sick. Jesus makes an offer. Says, I will come and heal him. Are you there? The centurion answered by Jesus and said to him, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under are you there? But only speak and my servant next verse. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this one, go. And he I say to another, come. And to my servant, do this. Aha. Uh -huh. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even. So we saw little faith. We saw mustard seed faith. Now we are seeing at each level of faith, you've got the capacity to manifest according to the measure. You're getting what I'm saying? So if you're dealing with a situation that seemingly is an insurmountable, if you like, is greater than you, is overwhelming, it's time to build your faith. All right? Does that make sense? Now, I get carried away on this because, and this is a, 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 not, not in my notes, you will notice how this man had faith. He had faith because he was a man under... Church is going quiet on me. He was a man under... He was not a man of... Because many of us, when we read it, he's a centurion. He's in the army. He's in the military. He must have authority. And when we read what he says, he's demonstrating his authority. I say to one, go. And he goes. I say to another, come. And he comes. Are you there? And therefore you speak the word and it shall be done. But when he speaks to Jesus, he's emphatic and saying, I am a man under authority. Im Im implicit with that is that while I have the capacity to tell someone to go and come and they do it, is because there's someone who also tells me to go. I am under authority. So when they tell me to go, I go. When they tell me to come, amen. And because I am in submission, I also have the capacity to command some things to happen. Still, still, yeah, marionette, yeah, yeah, just for a few minutes. There are too many people trying to command things to happen when they are not under command themselves. Tell everything to move, but no one tells you to do anything and you don't do it. The, <laughs> Are you getting where we're going? <laughs> he says, I can tell a servant go, and he goes. I can tell him to come, and he comes. Because I am under authority. What gives me the authority to tell others to go and come is because there's someone also who if they tell me to go, I can go. If they tell me to come, I obey. There are too many people trying to command who themselves, for lack of a better word, are not commandable. And when you're decreeing things and they are not established, you go to complain to God. After all, your word says you shall decree and it shall be established. No. If you've got the power to decree and establish, it's because you are a person who is under authority. Are you alright so far? So, we were looking at the measures of faith and we're looking at them from the aspect of how faith quote-unquote, seemingly may not work so that you cannot have little faith, trust and have confidence in God for clothes and food, and yet you are putting all of these things that God should do instantly before the end of the week. I hope you get what we are saying. And then when it does not happen, ah, God, this faith ah, doesn't work. So, understand, the Bible says, think soberly 
according to the measure of your faith. Amen. Are you alright? Number two. While faith seemingly does not work. Faith always works. I've given the disclaimer that we're using so to explain why certain people think faith has not worked. Number two, why faith seemingly does not work. Number two, sin. Sin in our lives. The presence of sin in our lives. You see, the problem with the presence of sin is that it delivers a consciousness of condemnation. It delivers a consciousness of you do not deserve this because you are not right with God. And many times when people are seemingly wanting to do this and yet there is the presence of sin, you find that it short circuits your faith. All right? It's quiet in here. Isn't it interesting that God spoke to Joshua to take Jericho and he did it? Amen? And Joshua now went after Ai. Remember that small city? But there was a man by the name of Achan who had sinned and taken the things and hid them in his house. When Joshua assessed Ai, his measure of faith, he said, this one, we don't even need to take a lot of people. Are you there? He says, we just need to go, just a few of us. It's a small city, few people, we will take it. He says, when they went there, they were defeated. And when they inquired why they were defeated, God answered, there is sin in your camp. Amen. Amen. This is not to scare anybody, but this is to help you. That sometimes when you see that things are not working, check your lifestyle. Amen. You cannot live like a dog and expect God to bless you like an angel. We're just talking now. Amen. Because what sin does is that it delivers. You see, the parameters of how God operates, they operate in righteousness. It's actually called the law of righteousness. And it's not a law. It's a, they use the word the law of righteousness to mean that there is things that come with the law of righteousness. Righteousness in God seems, simply means right standing before God. Now, we all have fallen short of the glory of God, but repentance brings us into right standing with God. Are you there? And repentance happens like this. You confess your sin, all right? And confession is acknowledging the sin, all right? Repentance is changing your mind and approach concerning the thing. It means that you will not do it again. And if ever it happens, it's not deliberate. Amen. That you've changed the way you think concerning sin. That's why for a believer, you don't sin, you fall into sin. To fall means you have to come from a higher place to a lower place. For a sinner, it is normal to sin, it's the same level. For a believer, you have to fall from a higher place in order just to sin. Sin requires a believer to downgrade themselves just so you can sin because you have to come to a level that's not yours. Your level is seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's where we, you and I belong. Amen. And that is why when you sin, you feel bad. If you don't feel bad, you need to come for deliverance. Because that is a sign that there is something seriously wrong with your life. That feeling bad is actually the, 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 the consciousness of God telling you you are operating at a level that is below your normal. Amen. And the Bible says from there the Lord wipes not only our sin but even the condemnation for there is now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus behold the old is gone and the new has come amen tell your neighbor operate at your level Ooh, tell your other neighbor to operate at your level 
the level of faith, the level of God, the level of power, the level of strength, the level that unleashes the force of faith. Amen. Number three. Faith, quote unquote, like I said, faith always works, but faith will seemingly not work when you have a wrong picture of God and of yourself. When you have a wrong picture of God and of yourself. I am in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Are you there? And this is seemingly the same strategy that the devil uses to this day. Amen. He has not changed his emo. Emo, motos operanda. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, everybody, one, two, three, read. Uh huh. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you lest you die. Next verse. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing you can go on. So the woman saw the serpent that it was good for good and she gave some to her husband and they ate. Now, here is where most of us our faith is short, quote unquote, faith is short circuited. Quote unquote. It is this. Number one, notice that the woman said to her, the serpent said to the woman, that when you eat the fruit, you will become like who? Are you there? Already delivering to her that she was not good enough, that she needed to eat something to be good enough. Now, for God knows that in the day you will eat, you, your eyes will be open and you will be like what? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Are you there? Put it quickly. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And the Lord God said, let us make man in our what? According to what? Now, please notice. Image and likeness that you will be like God. It wasn't sure then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Next verse. So God created in his image, in the image of God, he created male. He created what? Now, she is already created in the image of God. In the likeness of God. But when the serpent comes to talk to her. He tells her you need to be. And yet she already is. The moment the serpent succeeded in delivering to her. That she was not at the level where she needed to be. She now was aspiring for what she already was. And she now embraced a wrong picture of who she was. That's why we do this a lot in church. We tell you, speak the invocation. I am a child of God. I am the beloved of the Lord. I am the apple of his eye. What are we trying to do? That there is no opportunity for the enemy to deliver to you a distorted image of who you are in Christ. Because one of the things that will kill your faith, that will cause your faith, if you like, to short circuit, and that's not true, but that will make you feel frustrated and things are not happening, is when you do not have the correct picture. Of what God has created you to be. And you must not allow at any point for the devil to negotiate who God created you to be. The Bible says, and the heavens opened, Luke chapter 3. And they all heard a voice saying, this is my son 
in whom I am well pleased. And the Bible continues to say, and the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The first temptation of the devil was not for Jesus to eat bread. The first temptation of Jesus was, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. It was about his self-image. And as long as Jesus maintained a correct picture of who he was in God, it was impossible for his faith to be sabotaged. You must come to the place where your image in God is never sabotaged by the enemy. Because that is what the devil uses to, to frustrate many people who are believers. Because it makes you feel inadequate. It makes you feel like you're not good enough. After all, your tongues don't sound as good as that one. After all, you can't pray for five hours like that one. No, you are still a child of God. You are still the one that is seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You are the apple of his eye. You are the one that he died for. You cannot allow a distorted image of God for yourself. Make sure that the picture you have for yourself is correct in Christ. That's why there are so many of these scriptures that we confess. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In him I live, in him I move, and in him I have my being. It's not so that we can sound more spiritual or scriptural. It's so that we affirm our self-image. Do you know that Jesus died for you? Yes, when you start praying, I may wear my, he still died for you. And whether you, 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 you embrace that wrong image, it is important to embrace the image of God for you. You may think of yourself as a worm. He does not think so. Because if you're a worm, he would not have died for you. He must think more highly of you than you think of yourself for him to die such a painful death on a cross. He must think you are worth it. He must think you are the born. He must think you're the next big thing that is yet to happen. He must think something about you that you need to embrace yourself. That's why the Bible says, let this mind that was in Christ be in you. That we have now received the mind of Christ. That while everything we have done, our mistakes, our shortfallings, may say another thing, but we refuse to define ourselves by our mistakes. We define ourselves by the image that God has showed us as who we are. Tell your neighbor, I am everything God says I am. Try the other neighbor, tell them, I am everything. Everything that God says I am, I am. It will trigger, it will fertilize your faith. When you begin to see yourself with the same picture that God sees you. You are a child of the most high God. You are the beloved of the Lord. You are the best thing that he made on the planet earth. Of all the dogs, of the animals, of the birds, of the whales, of the fish, of the dolphins. None of them. Even the lion or the elephant. None of them. Come close. To the manifested project. That God made when he made you. You were made in his image. And in his likeness. Don't ever allow the enemy. To give you a wrong distorted self image. That's why the Bible says we must be transformed. Amen. Not to think according to the patterns of this world. But transformed by the renewing of our mind. To think of ourselves as God thinks of us. It triggers your faith. Again, on that point, you must have a correct picture of yourself. You must have a correct picture of God. Many of us find that we struggle to manifest faith when our picture of God is distorted. And this is a big one. Because the Bible says, when the enemy came to the woman, he said, Please put Genesis chapter 3. He said to her, God knows that when you eat of this tree, are you seeing that? For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be knowing good. In this statement, the serpent is convincing the woman that God is holding out on her. 
In this statement, the serpent is implying that this God has deceived you. That he did not give you or reveal to you the whole truth. That there are some things that he could have given you, but he's being selfish. Because he knows that if he gives you, you will become like him. It also goes on to suggest that there are things that God does not want you to become but are good for you. Now, the moment you have someone in your life that you know they don't have your best interest at heart, whenever you are in their circle, you tread carefully. Because you are not sure what they would do, what they would take and even use against you. After all, you are not sure whether they have your best interest at heart. You can't be open. You can't be free. You can't operate properly when you know you're in the presence of someone that's holding out on you. That you know they could have helped you, but they don't want you to be better than them. I don't know if you've ever been there. All of a sudden, even your laugh changes. You would freely laugh and smile. Now you check how you laugh. You, you, you just give enough for the moment. Are you there? This is one of the biggest lies that the serpent delivers. And many times this, the serpent would deliver it in this form. The Bible says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to... And when all of that happens, he will tell you, if God really loved you, why would he allow? And all of a sudden, you stop looking at who did it. Me to be fired. And all of a sudden, your image of God is now being distorted. You're almost beginning to suspect God. Mm, do you really love me the way you... I mean, is there something... And the moment the woman started to see God outside of the picture of who God really is in her life, at that moment, faith was lost. Please notice that after that, they were chased out of the garden. Amen. After that, they were chased out of the presence of God. After that, they were naked and needed clothing. After that, to eat, they had to sweat. In other words, life became hard as long as their picture of God was distorted. Are you okay so far? And so sometimes, whenever you carry this mentality that you know you're only looking out for you, that sometimes you don't know whether God will do you good or not, you cannot fully manifest faith with a wrong picture of who God is in your life. That's why God has to use scriptures like, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of good and not of evil. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Plans to prosper you and give you an expected end. It is you and I coming to the place where we settle it. Tell your neighbor, settle this. Tell your other neighbor, settle this. You need to come to the place where this is settled. That God has got the best intentions for your lives. You need to come to the place that even though your parents love you and they've made a plan for your life, their plan for your life cannot beat God's plan for your life. You need to come to the place where it must be settled that even when you hope for the best for yourself, as much as you hope for the best for yourself, what God hopes for you cannot be better or rather you, what you hope for yourself cannot be better than what God hopes for you. Whatever God is hoping for you is the best. You need to tell you that you need to settle this. Uh, uh, let's, let's talk now. Tell the other neighbor, you need to settle this. You need to settle this at the place where you know that there is no one in this world that loves you like God. That there's no one in this world that has got your best interests like God. You need to settle this and know that whatever God's intention for your life is, is there is no plan superior to that plan. You need to come to the place where it is settled so that whatever you are seeing, whatever you are experiencing does not make you change your mind. That you are able to say, no matter what I'm going through, God has got the best plan for my life. When you settle this, faith will begin to manifest. You need to come to the place of the three Hebrew boys. 
that they are now being sentenced to be thrown into the fire. And they say to themselves, there is no way we are going to change on God. We know the situation does not look like it. We prayed for God to keep us from entering the furnace. But whether we enter or not, in our minds, it is settled. God is the best. God has got the best plan. No matter what my life circumstances are looking like, I refuse to believe my life circumstances. I choose to believe that God's plan for my life is the best. Tell your neighbor, you need to settle this. I don't know what they say to you at your place of work. And you may be using that to, 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 to contaminate, to, to sabotage your faith. Listen to me. That is your employee's report. God's report says you are the head and not the tail. God's report says you are above, you are not beneath. God's report says you are blessed in the work, in the city, you are blessed in the field. That wherever you go, God's plan for you will manifest. You need, tell your neighbor, you need to settle this. Tell your other neighbor you need to settle this. So whatever report you have received in the few months of 2024, you do not need to believe it because your mind and heart must be settled as to who is in charge of your life. It is not your employer. It is not the doctor. It is not your relatives. It is God. And no matter what you see with your eyes, no matter what you feel in your body, it must be settled that it is God. God who is in charge for you and that it is God who's determining your future and that he has the best intention for your life. That no matter what you will be able to do for yourself, it can never beat the plan of God for your life. Tell your neighbor it is settled. Tell your neighbor it is settled. And that's, this is where most people ask me, but I was in faith. And then when I saw what happened, I asked God, I said, how could you let me down? I say it was not settled. Because if it was settled, whatever happened or did not happen should not have moved you. If, if, if you were praying that they don't dismiss you and they dismissed you and it affected you, it was not settled. Because when it is settled, it does not matter what you receive. In you, it is settled. Now, they've given me a letter. I'm going to go home, but I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, God is still making a way. Maybe there'll be an appeal. Maybe they'll change. I don't, but for you, it must be settled. But the moment you receive that letter, that bad news, and it affects you, it is a sign. It was not. Because when it is settled, faith will always work. It will always work. It will always work. When it is settled, faith will always work. Because at that point, it becomes impossible for God not to do it. That even if your Lazarus dies and it's been four days, but you are in faith, they have to roll the stone. They have to roll the stone. Everybody's crying and saying it is over, but you, it is settled. This thing is not over until God says it is over. And I've not heard him say it is over. So let everybody begin to cry and mourn. For me, it is settled. Tell your neighbor, it must be settled. You have to come to the place in your heart that you have this confidence in God. You know confidence, Yashiba and Daija. <laughs> that you have this confidence in God that no matter what men are saying, for me, it is settled. Beloved, hear me. One of the attacks of the enemy is to always make us feel like God is shortchanging us. That if he loved us, if he was a good God, how come you're going through what you're going through? And the moment you embrace that mentality, it is a mentality that will cause frustration. And seemingly, you will see as if your faith is not working. But the moment you embrace a perfect image of yourself, a godly image of yourself, and you embrace a godly image of God, it is impossible for faith not to work. It is the place where with faith all things are possible. Are you here, somebody? My time is fast spent. To be honest, that was not even what you've seen. I've not even gone to Hebrews. <laughs> but I thank God that you've learned something. And I'm also grateful because we're in a series. So whatever we have not shared today, we still have an opportunity to share on Wednesday. We an opportunity to share on 
the next Sunday and in the coming weeks. Amen. Amen. And so you have to understand, therefore, that... Okay, so let's end with these three things. I will just shoot them. I will not explain them. All right? Three things. Why is faith important? Why is faith important? Faith is important because all the promises of God are received by faith. Why is faith important? Because all the promises of God are received by faith. If God gives you any promise for you to manifest that promise, the medium, the weaponry, the equipment, the tool is faith. Amen. So whatever God will promise in his word, if it has to become a reality in your life and my life, the thing we use, the utensil for manifesting that is faith. Amen. Number two, faith is important because you don't just manifest what you believe. You become what you believe. Faith is important because you don't just manifest what you believe. You become what you believe. The Bible declares, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So whatever it is that takes root as the dominant thought, dominant belief, is what you will eventually manifest. Are you with me? That's why you find scriptures like, he who finds a wife, finds a good thing, and obtains favor from the Lord. Why? He didn't say he who finds a girlfriend. Why? Because her dominant thought and belief is she's a wife. And the other man just finds someone who is already a wife. It is not the husband that makes her a wife. She was a wife. That's why he found her. Her dominant thinking, belief, is I'm a good wife. And yet there's no husband in sight. So the man finds a wife. Not a girlfriend. Not a side chick. Not, oh, sorry. My bad. <laughs> Apologize. It says he that finds, because the dominant thought and belief. So you become what you believe. Whatever you believe, you will become. Number three, as we close. So number one is what? Why faith is important? All the promises of God are manifested by faith. Number two? Come on, talk to me now. You don't just manifest what you believe, but you become what you believe. Amen. Number three? For you to defeat the enemy, you need faith. Go and check. The Bible says that when we were, and I thank God that uh, Bishop Ngami and Pastor Tim Grace say, laid a good foundation. One of the weapons in the armor of the believer is the, we have the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, sandals of the gospel, the sword of the spirit, and the shield of faith that is able to deter all the wows of the devil, of the enemy. Are you with me? That for you to have a proper defense mechanism against the enemy, it is by your faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith which will, which, with which you will be able to do what? Quench some, half most, oh, the fairy darts of the wicked one. In other words, whatever the enemy plans against your life, one proper defense mechanism you can have is faith. Rev, I'm under attack. Live by faith. <laughs> faith has got the capacity to defend your life, your destiny, your house, your home, your children from any attack of the evil one. Are you with me? The Bible tells us, Paul speaking, I think it's in Timothy. He says, fight the good fight of faith. 
Meaning, faith is for warfare as well. That you use faith to, you, you, your fight, you know, that's why they laugh at us as Pentecostals. Because when we are fighting the devil, there are all these videos that are going around, ponda satana, ponda, ponda, ponda satana. Now, you can finish your energy pondering satana, but if faith is not present, you're just losing weight and doing gym. <laughs> you're doing some gym work. The true manifestation of your victory over the enemy is the demonstration and manifestation of your faith. I'll use this as my last point, or my last verse to just cement the point. Hebrews 11, 33. Hebrews 11, 33. Everybody? On the count of three. One, two, three. Uh, go back, 32. Sorry. Uh, where do we start from? Uh, yes, thank you. 32 is good. Everybody on the count of three. One, two, three, go. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Barak, Samson, and Jeff. Yes. Also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Next verse. Who through faith. Ah, I go back, just that one. Oh, yeah, okay, it, it looks good. Quenched what? Uh huh. Became valiant in battle and turned to flight the armies by what? Faith. Amen. So, who is the principality at your place of work that is giving you a hala? How do you fight? Not in flesh and blood. For our weapons are mighty in God. To the pulling down of every stronghold. For we do not fight against flesh and blood. But in faith, we are able to come against every work of the enemy. And have victory in Jesus' name. Faith is important because it guarantees your victory. Whether you're a businessman, you know that there are sometimes I talk to people and sometimes I hear people who are not even saved make statements and I'm saying they're operating in faith. I mean, this guy is doing things and he just believes this business thing will work. And believers who are entitled, who have the Holy Ghost in them, are operating with, um, should I, should I, maybe, maybe. And yet God and all the vast armies of heaven are on your side. You will win. By faith in Jesus' name. You will see God's goodness by faith in Jesus' name. You will see your victory in every area of your life by faith in Jesus' name. Where the enemy has laughed, where the enemy has celebrated, where the enemy seemingly has played a number for years over your life, it is coming to an end in the name of Jesus. You are a child of faith. You are a child who carries the spirit of faith. You are a child who operates in the faith of God. And your season for victory is here in the name of Jesus. Whatever is in the past is in the past because the old is gone. The new has come. It's time for a new you to manifest fest in the name of Jesus. Listen to me. Back in the day, we used to watch some of these movies. They were Western movies. And they would say, ready or not, here I come. There's a statement you must make to the devil. To whatever he has done over you, over your family, over your past, over your career, ready or not, devil, here is a new me. And here I come. I'm coming with everything that heaven has delivered to me. I'm coming with my faith. I'm coming with the word of God in my mouth. I'm coming with the shield of faith. It is time for you to manifest your victory. Listen to me. This thing can change in the name of Jesus. I feel a word in my spirit and it is a word called overthrow. Overthrow, overthrow. Uh, just out of curiosity, give me uh, Hebrews 11.33. 11.33? 11.33. Hebrews 11.33. Please give me hmm, NLT. NLT. By faith, these people, whoever has been sitting and dictating the terms of your life, I declare this time for an overthrow. It's time for you to take over in Jesus' name. I hear in this, somebody needs to, you, 
they've been terrorizing you <laughs> by faith you are about to overthrow kingdoms when you do an overthrow the one who was in charge ceases to be in charge a new person takes over and is now in charge i declare there is an overthrow about to take place in the name of jesus Eli, there's an overthrow as to who determines your health. There's an overthrow as who determines your finances. There's an overthrow as who determines your destiny. There's an overthrow as who determines the course and, and progression of your life. Whoever was in charge was saying you are not going anywhere. It is changing in the name of Jesus. By faith, they overthrew kingdoms. It is time to overthrow every power of the devil over your life, over your family, over your career, over your destiny. I don't care if there's a witch at your place of work. You are a child of faith. And by faith, there is an overthrow in Jesus' name. Everybody standing. Everybody standing. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms. Yes. It's time for power to change. Whoever has been dictating Whoever has been calling the shots, we are changing now. It's time by faith to overthrow. You are the one dictating how your life will go by faith. You are the one that will decree something and it will be established in Jesus' name. You will no longer live in fear as to who will do what, who will press what button, who will say what, and then your life is... No, you are the one that in your closet, the things you say, you will see them manifest publicly in Jesus' name. It's time for an overthrow. Lift up your hands. Begin to talk to your father.